Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. Good evening. Great to have your company as always. Here's what's coming up on Credlin. With charges now laid against five of the seven teens arrested yesterday as part of those counter-terrorism raids, I'll bring you all the latest details. I'll also discuss with John Anderson why the age of the accused boys is so concerning, one there as young as 14. Despite most Australians taking today to reflect, there was, of course, the perpetually outraged activists who've tried to hijack Anzac Day. Shortly, a Vietnam veteran will join me. He's got something to say to those who want to denigrate Anzac Day, including an elected official. Plus, with past conflicts on our mind, now's the time to look to the future and the very real prospect of war in our region. Now, in the past, there was a document, it was called the Commonwealth War Book. Now, what's become of that? Do we need one now? Well, a few experts say we do and that we need it urgently. I wrote about this too today in The Australian, the push for a pandemic treaty by the United Nations. And I'll explain why this is a very bad, indeed dangerous idea. And of course, a special show tonight to commemorate a sacred day. We'll have all the highlights from Anzac Day services here and overseas. We'll talk to the national president, the RSL, and a former SAS soldier who's running for the Liberals at the next election. But most of all, this is a day where we all stop and remember. It's wonderful, it's especially wonderful. against the young. It's getting bigger and bigger. Every and the year, way that they're right. actually applauding us women, hey, yeah, it no, is it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's really good to it's see. It's such a wonderful feeling of marching along and getting that. <laughs> Anzac Day is a day to represent our country, respect, you know, all the soldiers that fought for us in the past. Because we give back, that's the Aussie way. So it's a bit of a twofold day, eh? a lot of happiness, but a little bit of sadness. But first, as we have every year since 1916, Australians came together today to honour our war dead and our armed forces personnel and to give thanks for the country that they shaped and defended. Now, it's important to remember why Australians went with such vast numbers to fight in the Great War. We believe that freedom was under attack and that we had a duty to stand beside our allies. As the then Labor leader Andrew Fisher pledged in 1914, Australians will stand beside our own to help and defend her to the last man and the last shilling. Well, quite literally, we did. From a country with under 5 million people, more than 4,000 of us, 400,000 of us enlisted. More than 300,000 of us served overseas, including my great-grandfather and all six of his brothers on the Western Front. 150,000 were wounded and 60,000 of our own never came home. As a great war historian Charles Bean said of the original Anzacs, the good, the bad, the greatness and the smallness of their story will stand. It rises as it will always rise above the mists of ages, a monument to great hearted men and for their nation, a possession forever. Australia has always answered freedom's call in the Second World War, we sent an army to the Middle East, a fleet to the Mediterranean and an air force to Britain, as well as a garrison to Singapore and another army to New Guinea and the Pacific Islands. In that war, from a population of scarcely 7 million, almost a million Australians wore a uniform, including there my great-grandfather, Pa, my mum's dad, who was wounded in action in New Guinea with his best mate, killed alongside him. Brendan, his mate, was one of the 40,000 Australians who made the ultimate sacrifice. And then on to Korea, Vietnam, Somalia, East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan, our soldiers have done us proud, helping our allies and doing what we could to protect other people and allow them to live in decency and peace. Today, from the Prime Minister down, we honoured them all. For me, Anzac Day has always been a day of pride, but also a day for reflection. It speaks to the best of us and the best of our country. And sure, we're not perfect. We don't always agree on everything. But we should never allow this day, this day of all days, to become contaminated by politics, 
all the self-doubt that today corrodes so much of our national life. A small ratbag element used today to make their tawdry political point about Palestine and for God's sake, show some respect. Earlier in the week, a group called Teachers for Palestine tried to link the Australians who helped liberate the Holy Land from the Turkish rule under white imperialism and somehow to make them complicit and us complicit in the suffering of Gaza. Now, please stop distorting and rewriting our history. And there's an anti-Anzac Day undercurrent, even in some parts of officialdom. Now, I came across this today on the Department of Veterans Affairs official website. It says, and I quote, the Anzac legend has evolved over the years to become one that is more inclusive than the past. Australia Day, it says, still unites and divides Australians as the country continues to debate its history and notions of national identity. Now, that's the official website for our veterans. Give me a break. The minister, well, he should fix that nonsense immediately because we can't let this shame on Australia Brigade do to Anzac Day what they've largely done to Australia Day, namely turn a day of unity into a day of division. Now, let's be clear. Only those who think our country is not worth defending and worth preserving could possibly find Australia Anzac Day, Anzac Day divisive. Now, regrettably, there are some Australians who find large aspects of our country contemptible. Some of them are on the side of a mass of the only democracy in the Middle East. Some of them make excuses for terrorism and complain that the police did not inform so-called community leaders before making those raids yesterday in Sydney. But what's abundantly clear today is many hundreds of thousands of Australians turned out to pay their respects before our monuments to the fallen, the grace even the smallest, the tiniest of our country towns, is the quiet pride and confidence almost every one of us have, thank God, that this is still the best country in the world to live. And that's our challenge. That's our challenge today, to keep it that way. We honour all those who have served and all those who still serve and hope that we might be worthy of their legacy and the country that their sacrifice has kept and still keeps free, lest we forget. All right, it has been a busy day right around the country. Let's go to Canberra now for the headlines. Sky News political reporter Olivia Caisley. The Anzac spirit was alive at dawn services across the country as people paused to honour servicemen and women. A peaceful silence to remember those who didn't make it home and honour those who have. In Canberra, the dawn service took place at the Australian War Memorial. In Melbourne, the eternal flame burned bright as crowds gathered in the darkness. In Sydney, a sombre contemplation of sacrifice. You who have loved will remember the glow of their glad young years as you stand today to salute them in silence, with pride and with tears. The Anzac spirit alive in Adelaide and in Brisbane, veterans, their families and young servicemen and women took the time to reflect. And since the First World War, it's a spirit which has characterised Australians whenever and wherever they have served and sacrificed. A reminder that those who fought for freedom went to Gallipoli as everyday Australians. Anzac Day means a remembrance of a whole four years of being in the army from the, when I was 18 to I was 22 and serving in Borneo and New Guinea. So it's uh, essential we bring our kids and prepare next generation. I really enjoy just the reflective atmosphere of like laying the wreaths and kind of thinking about all the people that had served. Anthony Albanese attended dawn services in Papua New Guinea and Townsville after completing a two-day, 16-kilometre journey along the Kokoda Track. 
They were angels walking tall through the hell of war. To the people of PNG, I offer Australia's solemn promise. We will never forget. Meanwhile, away from the commemorative ceremonies, five juveniles have been charged over the alleged stabbing of a bishop at a church in Wakeley in southwestern Sydney last week. Leading Islamic leaders and organisations have told the Australian they fear broader societal divisions in the wake of the incident, particularly against the Muslim community. Two males aged 17 and 14 were charged with possessing or controlling violent extremist material. Two males, both aged 16, were charged with conspiring to engage in the preparation of a terrorist act. A male aged 17 was charged with the same offence, as well as custody of a knife in a public place. Olivia Kaisley, Sky News, Canberra. All right, let's bring in my panel now. For this Thursday night, Anzac Day, media writer for the Australian Sophie Ellsworth and the Deputy Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, Daniel Wilde. Well, Dan, I'm going to start with you. Anzac Day, great to see so many people out at dawn services and commemorations around the country. It looks like many of those, but not all, those planned protests didn't go ahead. But it didn't stop a Greens councillor, Raffaella Pandolfini, attending a service in Coogee wearing a, a kafia, which has become a sort of symbol of support now for Palestine. Honestly, on all days, Anzac Day, and of all places, at a service at dawn. Well, Peter, if you can't go to a dawn service and do it in a dignified and respectful way, don't go. Mm -hmm. uh, this is beyond disgraceful. Uh, it is a day that should bring our nation together. In my view, it's equal to Australia Day as the most important day on our national calendar. Um, and what we've seen at dawn services, it's not just Greens, but we often see acknowledgement of countries. Mm. Uh, we often see political statements. And as we've talked about before, Peter, the reason why we have to stand, or one of the reasons among many, we have to stand stro so strong on Australia Day is if they get rid of that, they'll come for Anzac Day next. They're not even waiting. They're, they're already starting to politicise our day. The fact that you would support Palestine and Hamas is bad enough but to do it in such an open way on our most sacred of days, which is for the veterans, it's for their families, and it's for our current servicemen and service women, is, as I say, beyond disgraceful. And again, like Australia Day, it's historically ignorant because our troops were there in the Middle East liberating the Arabs from Turkish Ottoman rule. But, uh, you know, don't let the fats get in the way of a bit of history there. Um, five teenagers too, one who was just 14, have faced court charge with terrorism-related offences. Sophie, this comes out at the time we've got a whole lot of um, Islamic leaders claiming that the police anti-terror operation was heavy-handed, they said. They weren't consulted prior to these, uh, these raids. The words are that the sudden nature of the arrest came as a shock, given that the community organisations were not told of any issues, nor were they asked for any information. Well, goodness me, isn't that exactly how we want a raid to be conducted? That's right, Peter. You don't want to alert them and say, hey, did you know that this is going on? I mean, they need to catch out these alleged criminals and they need to do their work without interference uh, from whoever it may be. And the fact that they thought this alleged attacker of the bishop acted alone and then they had hundreds of police involved uh, to look at this and, and has since uh, reported that it's possibly far more widespread, there's been more arrests, is very concerning. So, I don't think people should be alerted about this. The police should do their job without any interference. And one of the reasons you wouldn't alert them too, if, as the commissioners were saying yesterday, uh, their concern is about a network, uh, when they knock on a door and they take the kid away, and there's been obviously all of these arrests, charges laid today, they want to take the devices. I mean, a lot of this radicalisation and the, and the transfer of information is occurring online. So when you get into the home, you want to grab everything you can because you then want the next network to come from the network you've seized. And the net, like it just is this labyrinth. That's what they're chasing, that information. Oh, that's right, Peter. And that gives uh, the alleged perpetrators time to destroy. clean up their mess, yep. to destroy evidence, to do what they need to do. So uh, I think that's very silly if they think they should be consulted before these arrests take place. We know that the bishop, well, we know that there's a fight between the government and Elon Musk, but the bishop involved in the stabbing, uh, there was a document tendered in court yesterday, Dan, that said uh, he wanted the content to stay online. Well, he's gone further today. He's actually made some public comments. I think we've got a, a grab there. Let's have a listen. Noting our God-given right to freedom of speech 
and freedom of religion. I'm not opposed to the videos remaining on social media. I would be of great concern if people use the attack on me to serve their own political interests to control free speech. Well, I have to say, I share the nervousness of Bishop Emmanuel. Well, exactly. I mean, Australians are miffed by this situation. The government has used this to promote its misinformation laws. It's got nothing to do with misinformation. The stabbing happened. It is a video of an actual event. It is the opposite of misinformation. Mm -hmm. The misinformation laws are about empowering a bureaucracy to use the tech companies to shut down free speech online of mainstream Australians. On the video itself, I think Australians look at this and they say, well, hang on. If you're going to start taking content down, there's millions of videos on the internet that are way more graphic and violent than that. Why is the government taking or wanting to take this video down? I think it's to do with the fact that they don't want the community to be reminded of the serious problems we have in our society and the fact that the government is doing nothing about the breakdown of social cohesion. I think this is a political move, as the bishop suggests. It's not in the interest of community safety or community harm. And, of course, Dan, we've got all of the the Islamist hate speech coming out of uh, some mosques, but also, uh, you know, Islamic centres. And it goes viral and it goes around the world, but it's particularly influential with young Australians who, uh, you know, I've seen certainly in the past have been radicalised. And certainly that's what we think has happened in this in this immediate situation. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think what most Australians would expect is for it to be equal, the equal application of the law. So we've mm-hmm. seen it with protests, where if you're protesting against Israel, you get the red carpet treatment. If you're protesting against lockdowns and the police come out, it's the same with online speech. I'm, I'm pretty much in favour of maximal speech possible. But if you're going to start taking down content and censoring speech, do it in an impartial manner, but not in a way that's politically motivated, which this clearly is. We've had a bit of a breakout from the Labor backbench, which doesn't happen often. Labor's obviously, a, you know, in general terms, I think, a lot more disciplined than the coalition. We're heading into this budget. The polls are against the government. Uh, they're headed now on trend for minority government. And so you've got uh, a number of people in the paper today wanting wholesale changes to things like property taxes. They want big debt relief for kids with a hex debt. Uh, they want more money thrown at power bills. This will be quite a testing point because of all of that is highly inflationary. Absolutely, Peter. And, you know, we've got the inflation rate at 3.6%. We've got a cash rate at 4.35%. And we know inflation isn't where the government wants it to be. It wants it to come down even further. Uh, It's unlikely we'll get a a cash rate cut anytime soon. Uh, Just today, I saw petrol in inner city Melbourne, $2.35 a litre. This is in suburbia. So heaven knows what it is out in the regions where it's often more expensive. There are so many rising costs. But, uh, uh, you know, fiddling with things, Peter, such as property taxes, you know, negative gearing, capital gains tax, I think is very problematic and I'd be very shocked if the Labor government start tampering with this. Hey, what about those revelations today on housing? Because I was absolutely shocked. I mean, I know prices are big in Sydney. Mm. $1.6 million now is the median price. But Adelaide's almost at a million. Uh, Melbourne's well and truly over a million. Brisbane's headed that way too. It was out of control. <clears throat> Last couple of years, it's gotten out of control. The number one reason for that is mass migration. The, the program has not been planned for. Last year alone, we had over a million new arrivals come to our nation for the first time in our history. This government is overseeing the most dramatic expansion to our population in our nation's history without any plan for how they're going to be accommodated. Now, Claire O'Neill, the relevant minister, has said they're going to halve the intake. Well, I'm not holding my breath uh, for that. February was a record. February alone was 100,000. The average under the Howard government, the average per annum, was 110,000. That's right. And those figures came out only a few weeks after Claire O'Neill had promised to halve the annual intake. You've got issues at the state level, red tape, tax, urban development, property, uh, land release and so forth. Mm. At the federal level, the number one policy lever that the government could pull right now, they don't need legislation, they've got regulation, they can do it, is to reduce the intake until we get the houses built. Yeah, you don't have 15 kids in a two-bedroom apartment and then complain you've got nowhere to put them, right? You you think about these things. The government's not doing that. No, that's right, because 
it is their only growth strategy. We've talked before how the government has a redistribution policy but no growth policy. Mm -hmm. The only way the economy is going forward is by population growth. But per capita, we're in a recession plus plus. We've had four consecutive negative quarters of per capita growth. They're totally relying on this mass migration and they're all out of ideas. Thank you both. All right, we witnessed some special scenes today, didn't we, at the Dawn Services? Uh, I watched particularly the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. I used to go there regularly. The Shrine in Melbourne. We saw scenes in Sydney right across the country. And then we sort of just started to see this afternoon at Gallipoli and Villas Bretonneux in France, more services for Australians war dead. Everybody's turned out, haven't we? And those numbers are growing year on year. Veterans were honoured today. One of those veterans who joins me now is Michael Von Berg, who served in Vietnam. He's been with us before on Credlin. You enjoyed him very much last time, so I wanted to reach out to him today. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service, Michael. Give us a sense at home what this day, after all these years, still means to you. It's a very special day, Peter. I mean, the ability to catch up with your mates, and, you know, uh, what I find extraordinary by some in the media saying that, you know, it's uh, celebrating war is, is just absolute rubbish. What it's celebrating is we're not celebrating anything except we're remembering our mates, our war dead, their families who suffered extraordinarily in losing a loved one. But most importantly, I think it's that peer-to-peer -peer support, which is so important in the mental health space, mm -hmm where some people have been struggling and to get together and have a beer and a quiet yarn, it's just wonderful. When the haters come out, as they do occasionally, you must be heartened every year to see that the ordinary Australian, particularly younger people, keep turning up in droves. Those numbers are getting you know, larger and larger every year. That's the best response to those who want to run that glorifying war argument, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it's wonderful. And I think it's an example, I think, also of good parenting because to see those young people, little kids, you know, on the side of the road with their little Australian flag waving it and cheering, um, that's the next generation. That's the ones who carry us forward as a nation. And to see those people out there in, in, in hail, in sun, in rain, whatever the case might be, for the people who are marching, for the ones who have given their service, it is an incredible morale booster and not to be underestimated. Well, you, you rightly mentioned good parenting there, but we can't always rely on the education system to meet us uh, uh, halfway at least. We've got this group that was out this week, Teachers for Palestine. They say we shouldn't honour the Anzacs. They, they think we are indoctrinating children into glorifying war. They said that our soldiers aren't or weren't honourable. I mean, what would you say to that? I think it's disgusting. And what really concerns me is they are basically teaching kids in the schools as this group, radical advocates, they're teaching kids to hate their country. And in teaching kids to hate their country, what they're actually doing is they're basically teaching kids to have no self-worth. They're teaching kids to be, you know, not confident about themselves or their nation. And mentally, mental health-wise, I think it's a terrible thing to do to young people where they're just so confused. They should concentrate on the three R's. I would concentrate on my three R's, respect, resilience and responsibility. Just quickly, I mean, the Australia you grow, grew up in has changed a lot. And I think not a lot of that changes for the better, if I'm honest. And one of those things that I, I feel is starting to slip away is a, is a national sense of self. It's patriotism, um, respect, you mentioned it there, respect particularly, I'd say, for our flag. With a bit of age and, and, and hindsight, I mean, are you confident we can turn this around now that we're starting to acknowledge the problem? Michael, can we turn it around? Yeah, there's a great book and you, you know the book is The Power of One. And it all starts with the power of one. Exactly. Power of one becomes two. And, you know, with this sort of what I would call woke activism to try and attack Anzac Day, we knew it would happen. Australia Day first, Anzac Day next. They taking on the veteran community don't realise what they've taken on. 
and also in terms of the public, in terms of the Australian community, there are millions of families in this country that have some sort of a connection with the ADF, going right back to World War I, the Boer War. And I can tell you that if they are going to attack Anzac Day the way they're trying to undermine Anzac Day and the sanctity of Anzac Day, I think they're one hell of a fight. Beautifully said, I tell you, that is a rallying call. Michael Von Berg, great to have your company as again. We'll see you next year. Isn't he fantastic? After the break, we used to have a Commonwealth war book documenting Australia's military and civil operation plans. Should the worst happen and we're back at war, well, experts say we're not far off that sort of worry now. We need another book. We need it updated. I'll speak to someone in a moment to explain why it's needed. Plus, John Anderson... He's going to join me for his response to those teenagers charged with terror offences. Look, still to come, the UN's pandemic plan that the Albanese government doesn't want us to discuss, but we will, because it looks like they'll sign us up to it anyway. But first, there's been a series of warnings in recent times from experts who say we are not as prepared as we should be in the event of war. The Middle East and Ukraine show how quickly circumstances can change. And with China on our doorstep, we'd be mad to be as complacent as it seems our officials are. One such expert who isn't complacent, former head of Home Affairs Department Mike Pizzullo, who said in a speech last week, and I quote, we face, he says, before 2030, the credible prospect of having to defend Australia during a major war in the Indo-Pacific. Now, there's a lot that needs to happen to make Australia better prepared, but one common sense measure Pasulo has cited is to publish a new Commonwealth war book, which could, and he says this, deal with the entire span of civil defence and national mobilisation, which would be required to move to a war footing. As they say, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Joining me now, former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson, well, John, I, I found this uh, speech by Pizzullo, Mike Pizzullo to be fascinating, but the reminder about this war book, and I'll put it up on the screen for people at home, our last version of it was published in 1956 and, oh, you know, landscapes changed dramatically then, of course, but, but we all saw with COVID how hard it was, slow it was, to get the apparatus of government moving, you know, for the agencies to know what to do, uh, hospitals at one end, schools at the other, our borders, all of this stuff. We had huge issues with our supply chains, vaccines, masks, the whole box and dice. Now, in war, much harder still. I reckon we'd be mad not to working on a document like this. What do you think? Well, I can only agree with you. I would make the point at the outset that Mike Pizzullo is a very good strategic thinker. Uh, and, of course, his remarks have been widely reported in The Strategist, which is the Australian Strategic Policy Initiatives uh, magazine, premier pro uh, uh, journal, uh, and they are very, very worthy of attention, but b both belong to a category that apparently the government would rather not hear from. That is to say, they don't seem too keen on Aspie, and they, of course, sacked Mike Pizzullo. Uh, I'd be doing the opposite in both cases. I'd be upgrading Aspie, and I should declare I'm on the council of it, and I would be bringing Mike back into the security circles and seeking his advice because that's the, he's a very high-quality individual. Now, the war, war book in 1956 was there because it was a cold war. It was a dangerous era. The Australian people knew it was a dangerous era. Everyone now is telling us that it's just as dangerous again now. They, they all are, from the Prime Minister down. Why we would not be looking at what defence would need as well as how it would be backed up if something goes wrong is mind-boggling. I am well advised that, in fact, Angus Houston and his report to the government made it plain that this area should be addressed. We've heard nothing about it from the government, and yet, in reality, with everything from what would we do to secure the shipping we need? We don't have any Australian flagged ships. In every other war, governments have, have commandeered and paid for the flagged vessels of their own nation because you've got to, you have to be able to move your goods around. Uh, we don't have our fuel reserves. 
We don't know what we would do with the aliens in our midst. I mean, let's be really honest about this. We've got a real problem. We know there are people in our midst who we would have to assume hate us so much they wouldn't be on our side if something went wrong. What are the plans to identify those people and make sure that they don't become a danger from within if we're involved with external dangers that may involve our defence forces? The questions are endless. and um, uh, This is Anzac Day. Are we really worthy descendants of those giants who did lay down their lives, 62,000 in the First World War alone, to ensure that we can live like we do today? Are we worthy descendants of them? I ask myself that every single year. I think a lot of Australians do, John. And I think I just spoke to a Vietnam veteran a moment ago and I asked the question, you know, <laughs> We spend so much time now tearing down our national symbols. How do we turn the tide? He said, look, if you, if you go after Anzac Day, you're picking a fight with a lot of Australians who have a war connection. But I, I have to say, I think we're all a bit asleep at the wheel with Australia Day. We thought it was a fringe fight. And then, of course, local councils weighed in, the federal government weighed in, and now we're told we're supposed to feel shame about our history and, and, the, and the project to dismantle our institutions and our symbols won't just stop with Australia Day. So how do we fight back now, not wait for the inevitable? Two comments. Uh, I think you and I would share the view that the cream of our young people, particularly the younger, young Z, the, the, you know, Generation Z, the 26 years and under, the best of them, I think, are really waking up. And I think in part, particularly the male cohort, they're waking up because of the overreach of the activists who keep telling them how despicable they are, how they are the inheritors of this bad culture. Well, actually, it was your grandfathers and your great-grandfathers who were so terrible. That overreach, I think, is saying is, is pushing them back to sensible places, although it's radicalising some others and pushing them towards the Andrew Tate model of masculinity. And I think the other thing that I would say is that we desperately need leadership, and the two are related. You know, if you look at the Middle East, honestly, we're not being led as a country. If you look at defence, the obfuscation, the trickery around our supposed expansion in defence spending, it won't keep up with inflation. We wonder why young people are reluctant to be involved in the defence forces or to stay if they do go in. For half of them, there's no future there because the government talks big and there's nothing happening. Uh, you know, it's just, it's mind-boggling. I mean, as, as you and I have just sort of said, are we worthy descendants? I, I'm the son of a man who almost lost his life. Literally was one of those soldiers given up for dead by the medicos in the, on the battlefield in North Africa. I lived in the shadow of a man who risked all and almost lost all so that I could live the extraordinarily interesting and comfortable and free life that I've led. I'm not so sure that our current leaders recognise just how harshly history is going to judge them if they don't do the thing they're charged with, which is to lead, and there is no greater responsibility for the Prime Minister and the team around him than the defence of the nation. There is no greater responsibility. It's why we created the Commonwealth of Australia. John, just a quick comment. I'm sure you're as shocked as uh, I think we all are tonight to hear that one of the young people uh, arrested yesterday, now charged, is 14 years of age in relation to terror uh, allegations. I am, and I think Australians will start to ask a lot of hard questions, again, if they don't see more effective leadership from some of uh, uh, those communities, if you like, who have brought old hatreds to this country. The, they, 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 right. they say the right things when they're cornered. They need to stand up more. John Anderson, thank you, as always. You're fantastic. I tell you what, isn't he fantastic? All right, quick break. After the break, the president of the RSL will talk about his organisation, but I, I want an update. I know he's on the Council of the War Memorial. I want an update on those massive renovations underway. Plus, this is terrific, a former SAS soldier. Well, he's about to run for a seat for Peter Dutton in Canberra. That'll be interesting. See you then. Welcome back. Why we should be concerned about the new World Health Organization's pandemic treaty that could see Australia hand its sovereignty to the UN. But first, I want to return to Anzac Day and the wonderful work the Returned at Services League, the RSL, does for the welfare of the veteran community, but 
also the important place it occupies in the broader Australian community. Joining me now to discuss, National President, Mr Greg Mellick. Well, Greg, thank you for your time. Great to have you on the show on Anzac Day night. You've got to be happy with the crowds uh, right across the country that came out and stood with veterans to commemorate today. Yes, Peter, we're very happy and particularly happy about the number of young people that continue to come out and commemorate Anzac Day. How do you keep the RSL relevant to young people? That's got to be a, that's got to be a challenge. We're getting there. Uh, we've got to the stage now where four of our state's uh, boards are current veterans. Uh, we have this problem after every conflict. The World War II veterans ha found it hard to accept the Vietnam veterans, who some of who then found it hard to accept the current veterans. But uh, that hasn't dissuaded us from doing the work we do. Last year, we provided over 700,000 hours of uh, welfare and uh, advocacy services for veterans, free of charge. And that's one of our principal roles, mm -hmm. to look after veterans and their families. What did, what did you make of um, that decision by the government to allow public servants to take another day off instead of Anzac Day? I mean, do you see this as sort of the first chip in the in the edifice of the dignity of Anzac Day? First, you've got to remember that some public servants will have to work on Anzac Day and therefore will have days off in lieu. But to allow public servants uh, to swap the Anzac Day holiday, I think is disrespectful. My view has always been that when there's a public holiday, you either take it or you lose it. Well, I share that with you. I mean, I, I would love to be at home uh, and commemorating Anzac Day with everybody else, but my job's to be here. There are public servants whose job it is to be there and serve on Anzac Day, but I think Australians would be behind you in this. Um, obviously, I'm aware that you're on the, the Council of the War Memorial. A lot of my viewers are, are really interested in what's happening there in Canberra with the development. What, what's, uh, what's the latest? What can you tell us? Well, we had our first Anzac Day service today on the new parade ground. Uh, the development uh, committee and uh, the development manager, Wayne Hitchens, has been doing a fantastic job. Uh, we're meeting all the deadlines. Of course, there have been budget blowouts, like, with every, like every project in Australia, because of COVID and supply chain blockages. Uh, next year, the Stone of Remembrance will be back on the parade ground and the service will be back to usual. Uh, and it's then just a question of... Uh, finishing the work, which will in effect double the size of the viewing areas and, and commemorative areas available to the general public. I'm never amazed by the, the um, number of people who have never been there. <clears throat> they go to Canberra, they see the War Memorial. I know I think it's probably, a, I think it is Australia's number one tourist attraction. It's got uh, huge visitations, but they, they come away from it and they become absolute ambassadors for the for the memorial and they want everybody they know and love to get up there and see it if they haven't seen it. That's, that's the beauty of this very solemn place, isn't it? Yes, and look, uh, we bring international guests out and, and international visitors come and visit the war memorial and they can't believe it. It's probably the greatest institution of its type in the world. Uh, perhaps the memorial in the United States at Kansas might come close. Uh, we have over a million visitors a year and even during the construction phase we're get, having significant numbers. The only unfortunate thing is we have to have ticketed uh, uh, entry because we can't take as many people as we normally would. Once the development is completed, mm -hmm. hopefully that will go. Well, Greg Malik, thank you for your time on Anzac Day and thank you for your service as well. All right, my next guest, let's bring thank him you in. Thank you, Peter. He joined the Army as a diver he went on to be selected to join the elite SAS regiment where he received a commendation for distinguished service while in, uh, on a deployment to Iraq. He's got a unique sense of public service, though, because he's not long out of his uniform before he's putting his hand up to serve our country again, this time, he hopes, in the parliament in Canberra. His name's Darcy Dunstan, and he joins me now from Geelong. Well, we'll get, we'll get into your motivations to run for political office in a moment, Darcy, but, but on this very special day... How did you commemorate Anzac Day? Uh, thanks, Peter, for having me. So this morning I was fortunate enough to uh, be invited down by the Torquay RSL to speak at the Torquay Dawn Service. 
Um, it was an honor and it was a, a very, very large turnout from the community. It was about 10,000 or 12,000 people there. So it was really good to see the community getting behind Anzac Day in this region. And then uh, we went back to the RSL in Torquay and we had a gunfire breakfast and then had a couple of beers. Now, gunfire breakfast, remind me, that's a breakfast with rum in your cup, isn't it? That's correct. It was done on uh, Anzac Day in 19... Well, not Anzac Day, but it was done with the original Anzacs uh, in, the, in the early 1900s. Yeah, Peter Cosgrove, when he was Governor General, uh, invited me around there on Anzac Day one day and it introduced me to the joy of rum with, uh, with my bacon and eggs. I can't say I'm a big fan, but I certainly gave it a go. Hey, um, it's probably is the only there any difference? You can actually, I'm intrigued. Uh, drink rum at seven o'clock in the morning where it's socially acceptable. And get away with it. And not be called <laughs> an, yes, not be called an alcoholic. Um, I'm fascinated, given you've worn the uniform on these big tribute days, and now obviously you're not wearing the uniform. Is it any different to commemorate Anzac Day uh, in the services or out of it now? Uh, no, Peter, I, I don't think it is. I think it's a day where all veterans bind together, whether they're in uniform or not. Um, but it's also a special day for, for all Australians um, because it's a day where Australians bind together. Um, and, you know, in the early days of Australia, in, in the Federation in 1901, we weren't a united country. We're a country of migrants. We're a country of uh, farmers, miners, convicts, um, settlers. And when the young men and women got shipped off to the harrowing battlefields of World War I, um, they experienced things that many people in human history have never experienced before. Um, and that created the Anzac spirit. They brought that Anzac spirit back to Australia and that laid the bedrock of, of Australian culture. So it's a special day for veterans, but it's a special day for all Australians, I believe. Look, you're right to remind us, I mean, as a country, before we were obviously a federation of states, sorry, we're a collection of colonial states, but once we became federated, um, we were only 14 years old as a country before uh, our men landed on the beaches of Gallipoli. I mean, yeah. that, that is a sobering reminder. Hey, um, I have some spies down in Geelong. They said you knocked it out of the park this morning uh, with your remarks at the dawn service, but you're going to try and win that area of Karangamai from the Labor Party at the next election. Jeez, it's a big call to run for federal politics. What, what's motivated you to put your hand up? Well, Peter, I'm a former tradie, I'm a soldier, and, you know, no one is sticking up for hardworking Australians. And if there's one thing the military told me, it's to stand up for what you believe in, um, to have, you know, strong values. In the military, they call it a, a moral compass. But uh, people in our community in, in Karangamite, they're struggling. I mean, I'll use my mum as an example. It's one of many. Um, but, you know, she works at a hardware shop. She works all week. She works on the weekends. Um, she has a mortgage, and after she pays her mortgage repayments, she can barely afford to turn the heating on. And you know what it's like, Peter, growing up in Victoria. Uh, it, it can get pretty mm -hmm. cold. Mm -hmm. people, are people are telling me that uh, they're not taking their kids out on the weekend. People are telling me that they're not putting meat into their diet. I mean, is the government distracted? Are they, are they got their eggs in the wrong basket? Are they not focused? Um, because... We just need to get back to basics. And this is what really, really gets me out of bed in the morning. And it, I'm just really passionate about this because what are we really focusing on? The standard of living is going down the drain. I tell you what, Darcy Dunstan, you are welcome back on this show anytime you want to come back. I'm told you built your first house at 20. Uh, I think you're extraordinary. I wish you all the very best in your race uh, at the next election. There you go. Tell you what, doesn't he remind you of Andrew Hastie? I'm, I'm, it's the vibe. We know how good Andrew Hastie's turned out since he got into office. All right, after the break, we'll get into that whole issue about this uh, pandemic treaty and the World Health Organisation. We'll get into HEX too because a lot of people want it scrapped. Welcome back. Let's bring in my panel now. Former Liberal MP Nicole Flint and Pauline Hanson's uh, Chief of Staff James Ashby. Well, welcome to you both. James, I'll start with this worrying pandemic treaty that the World Health Organisation is in the final stages of, uh, of pulling together. It seems that the Prime Minister is in a rush to sign Australia up to it. 
Now, I wrote about it at length in The Australian today. The World Health Organisation, as we all know, it didn't cover itself with glory during COVID. I don't think we should give them any more power at the expense of our sovereignty. What do you think? Well, it's astonishing, Peter. This is not being taken to the floor of Parliament. It's going to be signed up under the Constitution's external powers, the same way as we signed up under uh, the UN agreement to the Paris Agreement. So these are using that external powers. It's it's just ratified by can be as someone as junior as a bureaucrat, but in this case, it's the Prime Minister who's putting his moniker to it, and this is damaging because don't forget this will give all. World Health Organisation powers to an unelected bureaucratic organisation over in Europe. And at the moment, we've got four pandemics underway across the globe. They're worldwide pandemics. That means if Australia signs onto this, they can make rulings for Australia like they can with Europe and every other country that signs onto it. It's bad news. It should not be happening. And I'd encourage every one of your viewers to actually write to the Prime Minister and say, no, 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 do not sign this up. Take it to the floor of Parliament and get a majority vote on it before considering it. Yeah, it is extraordinary, James, because what it does is it, I think it gives away our sovereignty in this area. It takes away the controls sure that we had as little that we had, though. I mean, the states ran roughshod over a lot of the rules. But, I mean, it, it is extraordinary. And I wrote about a, a former UN official who said this takes it from being a health advisory body to basically a supranational government entity, you know, basically a super government, a global government. And, and they're not making that up. No. No, you don't want to hand the, the power over where states have their own decision-making power, as we have we saw during COVID here. While I may not agree with the decisions that a lot of those states made, this is another reason why One Nation has called for a Royal Commission into the way that the COVID pandemic was handled. Not to lay criticism, but to learn from it and ensure that we don't make the same mistakes again like we did during this last one. But also, too, uh, if we are to make decisions, they need to be a decision suitable for Australians, not by someone uh, 12,000 kilometres away. Yes, and we see all the documents hidden from us during the last pandemic. Yep. Nicole, these calls for the HEX scheme basically to be scrapped. They want changes to the indexation. But the, the, the longer game is to, to basically do away with HEX. Now... I am a, not a fan of HEX. I was the first year, university year, that copped HEX. Um, you pay it off when your income hits a certain threshold or comes out of your tax system. But I have to say, I should have paid for my education. I should have put something on the table. Taxpayers shouldn't have paid the whole lot, the whole lot. And, of course, we all know that once you get a university degree, you're more likely than someone without a degree to earn more. I think it's only fair. What do you think? I think it's completely reasonable that we ask students to make a contribution towards paying for their education. It's not the full cost, Peter. Uh, like you, I had a hex debt and I paid it off all by myself. Um, so, you know, I did a law arts degree. Two of my siblings are teachers and my youngest brother is a mining engineer. We all had hex debts. We all paid them off ourselves. So it's not unreasonable. But what is unreasonable is the fact that the Albanese Labor government have delivered this high inflation that they don't seem, be, seem to be able to move and the hex debts are indexed to inflation. So young people are paying a lot of money, a lot more money off on their debts at the moment because of Labor. So I hope everyone out there watching lets their grandkids or their kids know if they're paying a lot more on the hex debt, that's because of Labor. So 2023, last year, was the highest uh, indexation figures that they've seen for, for a decade, and this year is almost as bad, and it is the Albanese Labor government's fault. James, what's going on in Queensland? Uh, well, sorry, what's going on with Labor? It's not just Queensland Labor. We saw it, obviously, with the Prime Minister and Chris Bowen. They had to take two planes to the same event charging taxpayers. But you've just had your Premier go around the state for, I think, three days, followed all the way along by uh, the police minister, I think it was, and the commissioner on their own aircraft. Why, why the two planes and taxpayers hit up for hundreds of thousands of dollars? 
Uh, Stevie Mile seems to think he's a royal prince getting around. This is what nine years of government does. Uh, they neglect to realise that they are blowing Queenslanders' money when they're doing this. They are forgetful that we're in a state of debt here in Queensland. And he also forgets that there are five services running to Cairns every day from Brisbane, five services running to Townsville and all those East Coast towns that he's visited. There is no reason to take two private jets, $30 million a piece, running at about $6,500 an hour, dumping more of that carbon dioxide that he's complaining uh, that we all dump into the uh, atmosphere. He's dumping it a year's worth in a single weekday. This is just ludicrous. This is a bloke who's lost touch with Queenslanders. He should learn that if he wants to travel Queensland, get in a car and do it like the rest of us, because he'll actually learn something by spending more than an hour in Townsville, uh, because if he was up there for more than an hour, he'd realise there are more problems than just crime. And that goes for most regional towns in this state. He spent too much time in Brisbane. Uh, I've got to jump in. I've got to leave it there. I'm, I'm afraid to say, James Ashby, Nicole Flynn, thank you both for your time. That's it for me. Andrew Bolt up next.